Um, so, this, uh, what I'm about to tell you today is from uh, this book. It's based on this book, um, which is out now, um, called Why Great Greatness Cannot Be Planned. Um, I'm a computer scientist, and I study artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, so you'll see a connection there. So here's the, the, just the general summary of what I'm going to be talking about. We were researching artificial intelligence. That's basically what I usually do. Um, but this sentence sounds really strange, but this is true. We ran into a problem with objectives. It's a very general statement. Um, but indeed, we saw a flaw with this very general thing that everybody does, which is setting objectives. Um, and therefore, the consequences of this discovery, which I'm going to show you, um, they extended way beyond just artificial intelligence to things like creativity, innovation, and collaboration. Um, let me give you the short summary, but obviously there's a lot of subtleties here. Um, setting an objective can block its own achievement. Um, but furthermore, um, it can be an obstacle to creativity and innovation in general, even if you don't have uh, any particular destination in mind. Um, and without protect, and this goes furthermore, it tells us that without protection of individual autonomy, uh, collaboration can become dangerously objective. And I'm going to show you that as well. The reason that this is really relevant and that we decided to write a book is because so much of our society is driven by objectives. Um, the gatekeepers are asking for objectives to justify almost any endeavor, including a lot of people here. Um, and if there is some kind of flaw with objective thinking, uh, then this should be really concerning to us, especially as it relates to creative and innovative endeavors. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with the artificial intelligence, and then I'm going to segue into the broad implications. So now this is going to seem like I'm going way off on another tangent. Um, but if you just bear with me, you'll see how this connects in. And in fact, this was as surprising to me as it is to you that this has anything to do with a general statement about setting objectives. Because when we first launched this experiment called Pick Breeder, we, we weren't trying to make any statements about setting objectives. Uh, this was an experiment with, with an entirely different motivation. But what we learned from it was really deep and really interesting and unexpected. So it's kind of serendipitous. So if you just bear with me, I'll kind of give you the sense of what this experiment was about and how it led to this realization. Um, we put this website on the internet called Pick Breeder to allow people to, no surprise, breed pictures. Um, and that really just means like the way you might breed, you know, horses or breed dogs. Um, like you have a population and you're breeding them. So like if you went to Pick Breeder and you told it you want to start from scratch, um, you'd see an interface like the one you see in front of you right now. There's about there's 15 images in front of you, and each one of those can be thought of as an individual in a population, like one of your horses. Um, and I can breed them just, just like I might breed animals, but I'll just have a single parent just for simplicity in the example. So like I might say, well, this one of the 15 is kind of interesting. Uh, let's see what happens if it has children. Okay, so there are its children. Um, and one of its children looks particularly different, so let's choose that one and say, okay, what, what if it has children, and so on. Now, if you think about this very simple toy, um, and sometimes things like this are called evolutionary art, um, you know, where do you think this could go? It's kind of interesting to speculate. You know, what do you think people would find? Like, say you did several dozen generations of this. You get tired pretty quickly. Um, but you know, what, what kind of things do you think you could find? Um, and the answer, I mean, we didn't know for sure what would happen. But what we did think would be interesting would be to unleash hundreds of people around the world into the search space and see what happens. And the answer was really astonishing, actually, for us. I mean, it's not really what you might expect. Um, and I'll give you a sense, a little sampling of the kind of things that people found. And this was a, a big surprise. I mean, first I should, I should emphasize that this is, not, uh, this is not the work of artists. This is not retouched in any way. Um, this is the result of breeding blobs. Um, and this is some of the things that uh, the users were able to find. Um, you can see some like, remarkable resemblance to kind of everyday things, like there's a skull and a butterfly. And, this seems to be Jupiter with its red spot there. Um, and so actually the story of why and how this became possible is really interesting in its own right. Um, and that's what I'm going to get into a little bit. But, but before I do that, I just want to give you one other little technical bit that's going on under the hood so you can really understand and appreciate um, how interesting the, the story ultimately is. And that is that there's one thing that you can do that I didn't mention yet, which is called branching. 
Um, and what's going on is that if I, found, if I was playing this game and I found something that I liked, I'm allowed to press a publish button, and that publish button will send it back to the website for PickBreeder, and then it goes into the PickBreeder database, and now anybody who ever visits again can see what I discovered. And what they're allowed to do is called branch, which means they can take the thing that I personally bred, and then they can decide to breed it further. So in some way, this is like kind of um, standing on the shoulders of your predecessors, you know, so extending on their invention. Um, and so, like for example, this, this face was um, on PickBreeder. Somebody published it. And I could come in and say I want to branch from it. And then what would happen is I get an interface that looks like this. Um, and it becomes apparent, and there's this, the usual game can be played. So now I can say, OK, I'm going to, let's say I like this one. I don't know, it has a big mouth, so we'll, we'll make it apparent. And then we can keep on iterating like that as before. And then I could publish when I find something interesting. Um, and that'll go back to the, uh, to the site. So the effect of this is that what's going on under the hood is that you're getting what biologists might call phylogenies large branching diverging phylogenies that look kind of like this. This is a small subphylogeny. There's about 10,000 images on the site, so this is just a small subset. Um, but you see what's happening over time as people branch upon branch upon branch, and that's what's leading to this stuff. So it's coming from branches upon branches. Um, uh, but it's interesting to understand why these discoveries are possible. Because you know, if you really think about it, I mean, these are really impressive discoveries when you think about their humble beginnings with just some really random blobs. And uh, I want to look at the question of how. How are people discovering these things? Now, actually, there's kind of two camps of thought. And I, I know this because I've spoken about this so much. Um, one view is, is sort of like compatible with what I've been saying, which is, yeah, I'm really impressed. Like, explain to me how this is happening. I don't really understand how this could be possible. But there's another view I want to address, which I'm sure some of you hold, which is, now, hold on a second. You're telling me I should be impressed here, but, but I'm not really sure I should be impressed. Because after all, let's, for example, think about this, like, this teapot here. Um, what if I um, wanted to uh, create a teapot? So this is where we connect into objective. So let's make it an objective, starting with just some blobs. But I want to get a teapot. Um, so I'll make it my objective. And what I'll say is, OK, given it's true that most of the blobs don't look like teapots at the beginning, of course. But I'll choose the one that looks the most like a teapot. And then in the next generation, I'll choose the one that looks the most like a teapot. So basically, I'm measuring my choices against my objective. I'm making incremental improvements measured against the objective. Um, won't I eventually inevitably get what I want, uh, my objective? So in that sense, why should I be impressed here? Isn't this all just inevitable, what you would expect? And if that were true, then I would agree that this isn't really that interesting. Um, but what's fascinating is that that is not true. It does not work that way. In fact, if you came in with that attitude, you'd almost surely fail. And that's why actually a lot of people find this game pretty frustrating. Um, well, I mean, think about it. I mean, this is what, why, why is any problem hard? The reason problems are hard is because we don't know how to get to the solution, which means, in effect, we don't know what the stepping stones are that lead to that solution. In any complex search space, space of possibilities, it's always going to be the case that we don't know the intermediate stepping stones that lead to our objective. Because after all, it, that's almost by definition. Because if we did know the stepping stones, then we just go there. So this is the hard problems. The interesting problems are always the ones where we don't know what the stepping stones are. And of course, in a space like this, you can tell just intuitively. I mean, I haven't given you all the under the hood you know, artificial DNA and stuff like that, because I don't have all the time. Um, but you can tell intuitively that this is a complex search space. It's not simple. So it's not like the things that lead to teapots are all just little mini baby teapots. It's going to be something different. Um, and in that sense, you can't get to these places by trying to get to them. So that's pretty puzzling, because when you look at this, then, then, then this really leads to a really deep question, which is then how the heck are people getting to these places? Because they're clearly getting there consistently. But I'm telling you, you can't get there by actually trying. So then what is the key to getting to one of these interesting kinds of discoveries? And I'm going to use this, the story of this car um, as a kind of an allegory for how this happens in general. And the reason that I can use this story is because I happen to be the guy who discovered the car. So I know exactly what happened um, along this path. And it's a really, this was a really um, kind of important moment for me when I discovered this car because it was the very strange experience of discovering this car that led me to first start having doubts about the objective approach in PickBreeder, um, which led to everything that I'm telling you today in the book that we have. Um, so this, in some way, strangely enough, evolving this car was kind of an epiphany or a, a, a turning point in my life. 
Um, so here's the story of the car. And the most important part of the story is just that I wasn't looking for a car. But what I did see was there was this thing that looks like, to me, an alien face. Actually, it looks like E.T., I think. And someone else had evolved that. I never would have evolved it. I don't know how to evolve it. But someone else did, so it was just on the site already. Someone had published it. And I was thinking to myself, as you might think, well, this looks kind of cool because like, if I chose this, I might get all these different aliens. It looks kind of promising in that sense to me, like a good parent for having lots of alien faces. So that's the road I went down. But then something happened, and this is the kind of moment of epiphany, which is that the eyes, these eyes, started to descend over the course of the breeding process. Ever so slightly, they started to descend. And I realized, at, there was a moment where I just realized, hey, this is starting to look like a car. And when I realized that, I suddenly realized I can get to a car. And that was the moment when it became possible. And then I was able to steer the process, with no pun intended, towards a car. Um, and so then I got a car. And this story is really strange. I want to emphasize how strange it is. Because you've got to think about all of the factors that had to come together for me to discover this car. Let me, let me just lay it out for you. First, someone had to do something that I never would have done, because I never would have evolved that alien face. And then second, I had to not be trying to do what I ultimately did. Because, after all, if I was looking for a car, I would not have started with this, because that is not a car in my view. So it sounds kind of like, okay, th this is a very sort of unusual set of circumstances that might be viewed as a, co as a lucky coincidence, even winning the pick breeder lottery, I mean, with all these extremely unlikely events kind of coming together to allow this discovery to happen. But here's the amazing thing. This is not a coincidence. It's not an exception. This is the rule. Almost every top image, all the interesting images on the site, has exactly that story. That's always the way that things are found. So, like, in other words, the stepping stones, they almost never resemble the final product. So let me just give you a couple examples here. Like, somebody evolved or bred this thing, and I call this an egg with a hat. That's what I think it looks like. Okay, so it is inconceivable that that person who discovered the egg with the hat said, aha, finally we can get teapots. There's no way that was happening. And similarly, the person who eventually branched from here and got to a teapot, they didn't start out saying, finally, there's an egg with a hat. That's just what I've been needing to get my teapot. It's inconceivable that that's happening. Or a dish that led to a skull, or this looks like a letter G that led to Jupiter. Um, it's always the case that the stepping stones don't resemble the final product. So it leads to this really um, counterintuitive moral, which is you can't find things by not look, you can only find things by not looking for them. And this is sort of a rule. Um, and so this is, this is an interesting insight about this site. But does it apply outside of pick breeder? Is there something special? And of course, I'm going to try to claim to you that this is actually a general insight about creativity and discovery. And it should start to be ringing alarm bells because we run our society as if this was not true. We are constantly setting objectives. How are we going to get to the skulls and the butterflies of our particular domain of interest if we run our society through objectives? Um, let me just show you a little more evidence just to drive the point home. So here's a, here's a weird experiment that we did later. Um, we said, OK, we know for a fact that the skull and the butterfly, just as examples, have been discovered. There's no controversy about this. Obviously, somebody discovered these. They exist. So they exist in the space of possibilities, clearly. Not only do they exist in the space of possibilities, but they seem to be relatively easy to find if you look at how much effort went into finding them. There were only 74 selection steps in the history that led to the skull. 90 in the history of the butterfly. So in terms of like you know, machine learning or computational search, this is peanuts, you know. I mean, we're talking about millions of iterations in modern algorithms. These are like dozens just to find these. So you might think, well, th these can't be that hard to find. And th they must be sort of like really close by in the search space to any kind of starting position. Um, but actually, so we said, okay, let, let's see about that. Let's test that. Let's run an algorithm which basically plays pick breeder automatically, but always picks the image that's closest to our target or our objective. So we make it into an objective-based search, and we try to rediscover things that were already discovered. This should be easy, right? But it turns out, if you look at these, each one of these images is the result of, and get this, a 30,000 generation attempt to reproduce that image. 
Remember, these only took a few dozen, but we gave it, you know, big computation because we're in the era of big computation. So we gave it 30,000 generations, and every time it's a miserable failure um, as an objective. Now, if this was just, you know, some normal machine learning benchmark, you, you know, you might say, well, um, you know, the, the problem is that for some reason you know, this, this is too hard to discover these things or the algorithm is not equipped or something like that. But that can't be the explanation here because we know these were discovered and with not very much effort, in fact. The explanation here is that you can't discover these things by looking for them. They can only be discovered by not looking for them. Why would that be? Well, it goes back to this notion of deception. Um, deception is, is sort of a, is a notion in search and people talk about search and optimization, it's a pretty familiar notion. But what this is saying is that this idea of deception is far more pathological than it's often give, given credit. In other words, um, this, what deception means is that you can appear to be going down the wrong path, but you're actually exactly on the road you should be on, or vice versa. You can appear to be way off the road, you can be appear to be on the correct road, but you can be running towards a dead end. People know these things as local optima. Um, but it's so severe. I mean, look at, look at, this is why we can't get to the skull by trying. Because look, like this crescent was something we would throw away if we said, I want a skull. You say, well, this is not a skull. It's not, it's not anything related to a skull. Or this donut, that's not a skull. Every step along the way is deceptive. Now, it's often true that in hindsight, we can make a connection. Like we can connect the eyes of the alien face to the wheels of the car. But going forward, there's almost no hope that that kind of very abstract or subtle connection can be made. And so deception is the reason that you can't find things by looking for them. So one thing we did like in the world of artificial intelligence and machine learning is we were thinking um, these implications are, are kind of disturbing because like even in machine learning, like almost every experiment is run through what's called an objective function. You know, everything I've been taught was that you set an objective and then you sort of follow a gradient towards that objective. But the world of pick breeder works exactly in the opposite way. You have to not be following the gradient of the objective. So he says, what if we actually just started to actually create algorithms that respect this principle, this non-objective principle? And we created an algorithm along those lines called novelty search. So what is going on in pick breeder? One interpretation of it is that it's a collector. It's not a, it's not a finder, it's a collector. It basically, it collects stepping stones. And the reason that that's powerful is because the more stepping stones you have, the more stepping stones you can get to. Now, if you say, if your next question is, but where are we trying to go, then you're missing the point. That is the point. We're not trying to go anywhere in particular. We're just trying to amplify our ability to get everywhere. And so we said, we can make algorithms like this. Like, I mean, we don't have to have objectives driving algorithms. So we created an algorithm which basically just says, try to generate completely new behaviors, no objective in mind, and just proliferate all the jumping off points that you can. And there, were, there was a succession of interesting results that resulted from this algorithm called novelty search over the last few years, which all sort of showed the same thing, which is that in many domains, I'm not gonna say all, but many, it is the case that you will get a better solution and find a solution faster by not trying to solve the problem. In other words, by just trying to generate novelty. And I'm just going to show you one example of this, just for illustration. And this is a biped walking domain. These bipeds were told, or, well, we, we wanted them to be able to walk. In the case on your left, which it says fitness best, we will see the best product of traditional objective-based optimization. We said optimize the distance you can walk. And that was sort of given to the, to the learning algorithm and said, come on, try to make the best walker you can. In the case on the right, we said just generate novel behaviors and, and, and if they're really novel, then explore them further and try to generate more novel behaviors. And what you can see is the best we got from that is far superior to the best we got from trying to optimize the behavior. So this counterintuitive principle raises its head again, but now in a very different domain from the domain of pictures. And that's sort of important because it shows you that this is a general principle. Yeah, I mean, and he, he had a bad night last night too. Um, so you may say, whenever people see results like this, it's always they're, they're, they're scratching their head first to say, this is, this is kind of disturbing and counterintuitive and there's gotta be a flaw here. But what you have to remember, and it's always sort of the answer, is the problem is deception. The stepping stones to walking may not look like walking. What are you gonna do then? You know, the thing is, like one stepping stone to walking is to learn the principle of oscillation. That's part of walking, right? And so, so what if you learn to oscillate but you fall on your face? 
I mean, from an objective optimization standpoint, you've made absolutely zero progress towards maximizing the amount you've walked. And yet it could have been the fundamental discovery that leads to the principle for very robust walking. And this is why objective optimization will not be the best way to generate walking. So the, prof the, the implications seem to us profound. Um, we started sort of putting these things together. It, and, and I apologize, this sounds like something out of a fortune cookie. Um, the path to success is through not trying to succeed. Um, to achieve our highest goals, we must be willing to abandon them. Um, or connecting to collaboration, it is in your interest that others do not follow the path that you, is, that you think is right, like the person who bred that alien face before me, which I never would have done, because they will lead the stepping stones to your greatest discoveries, like when I discovered the car. And when we're looking at this, we're like, you know, wait a second. It, this is actually not about computer science. I, I could tell this to anybody. Um, and, and this would be a deep, uh, a deep conversation. Uh, in fact, like, this is something that dawned on me over years because initially I was speaking about this a lot, as you can imagine, at like AI-related conferences um, or computer science conferences. And really in an algorithmic context, I'd be talking about these results. But more and more it dawned on me that people really wanted to talk about this stuff in like a human perspective. They're saying, what does this mean in general you know, for objective-driven discovery? You know, when you send a proposal over to the National Science Foundation and you say, here's my project and here's my objective, what is that doing to the way that the process of discovery works in general across all of science? The fact that we tend to guard our gates with objectives. You don't have an objective, so how can we give you any funding? I mean, what are you trying to do? It's completely unprincipled. But if, if it's true that often there are things that we cannot find, if we do have an objective, then we're in trouble. So, so here's some implications for collaboration. You know, because what it kind of says is that without care, and this, is, this reflects some of the things that have been said earlier in this conference, but without care, collaboration can lead to convergence and consensus of a very, very pathological type. Because the, the problem that happens when you're collaborating with people in a consensus-driven framework, which is like, you know, the way many institutions are run, if you have a panel of experts, you're moving towards consensus. Um, this is true. It's going to prune out the stepping stones. You're going to lose all your diversity. I mean, could you imagine if when I branched from the alien face, if there were a panel of pick breeder experts, like the luminaries of pick breeder, all got together and said, well, hold on a second. Like, is this really justified? You're branching from an alien face here? Um, no, and people need the ability to follow their radical paths to their bitter ends so that we can see where those stepping stones might lead. Otherwise, we get this mediocre washout effect. Compromise for all, but preference of none. And I can show you a great example of that. Coincidentally, and this is really cool that this happened about the same time, this project called the Living Image Project was started about the same time as Pick Breeder. Um, and it was really nice because it happens to have under the hood like the same mechanics as Pick Breeder, same kind of genetic encoding, artificial genetic encoding, same kind of search operators, except that instead of a branching operation, the way that it worked was it was based on voting. So it would show you some images just like you see in Pick Breeder, but you would vote. And over like a week, it would collect hundreds of votes from a palette of options. And then it would say, OK, whichever option got the most votes, that will be the parent of the next generation. And after 25,000 votes were cast, an enormous amount of human effort, these are the nine highest rated images of all time that were generated by the Living Image Project. And you can contrast that with the Pick Breeder. About, this is probably a lot more effort that was put into this project than Pick Breeder. And yet, look at how much more stunted these results are. Um, this, is, this, is a cons this is the result of convergent consensus. And it's just so stark. It's nice to show this through images, because it makes it so explicit. You know, we can talk about it in the abstract. But here it is in front of you. Is this the world that you want to create or live in? Um, <laughs> And, you know, th this is the world that we, that this is, just, as a, just again to reiterate this point, this is how science is basically driven. You know, we, we base science funding decisions on convergent consensus. What is it doing? What would the world look like if we were doing things this way? So, so on, your, on your left here, oh. back left, yeah. um, this is really exciting and, and, you know, I'm shocked also. Um, but there's a meta point here which I, I find also interesting and maybe you might want to comment on, um, maybe a meta point that might be right or might be not. 
you didn't set out to discover this. Uh, no. Right. No, we did so not. So the meta point is that this was discovered by not setting out to discover yeah, it. Yeah, that, that is a great <laughs> point. I mean, it, actually, to, to, to actually elaborate on that a little bit, just, just to make it even more ironic, I, I actually proposed pick breeder to the National Science Foundation before we'd made it, and it was uh, severely rejected. Um, and, and, and the explanation from the summary of the panel's feelings was that it's entirely unclear what your objective is here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not clear what you're trying to accomplish. Um, they said nothing good will come of this. Um, and, and again, this happened before any of this theory had arisen. So the trouble is, Lynn. NSF, oh, Lynn. Is, NSF is peer reviewed. It's a group. It's yes. consensus. Yes, exactly. it's converging not consensus. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this is my revenge. <laughs> right. Immediately next so, to Lynn. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if I were to think about this mathematically, I might think that if I were in the local in the area of the local maxim that I'm interested in, mm -hmm. I want to use the gradient method. But if I'm anywhere farther away from it, there are going to be lots of local maxima, mm -hmm. and I'm going to approach the maximum I want only by using a genetic algorithm, right? The gradient approach won't get me there. Yeah, so I mean, I think the spirit of that is correct. I would agree, except that it's not, it's not that it's a genetic algorithm. I mean, because a genetic algorithm can be run objectively. And in fact, in the world of genetic algorithms, they, even they are usually objectively driven. Like you give it something we call a fitness function, and then that is basically a measure of how far you are from your objective, and that's the score we give an individual. So, so there's like really, before novelty search, there's very few search techniques that existed that sort of captured the spirit of this intuition. Um, but it, in reality, we can sort of apply this intuition to almost any technique, including a genetic algorithm, because we can just reward something other than objective performance, like novelty. Or like in pick breeder, I'd argue what's being rewarded is what we call interestingness, but that's very hard to formalize. Um, I just wanted to, to highlight here that, that one of the lessons here is how essential it is to protect individual autonomy in creative endeavors. I'm obviously not saying that this applies to everything. Like, I'd be a kook if I got up here and told you, drop all your objectives, you know. No objectives anymore in corporate America. <laughs> uh, that would be crazy. Um, but when you're trying to foster innovation, it's in those pockets where this becomes a really dangerous problem. Um, and in those places, this shows you very starkly why it's so important to protect individual autonomy. Because the reason we're getting to these places is because people, once they branch, are completely isolated from everyone else. No one can interfere with me while I'm on my branch. I go wherever that may lead me. And that's why we get to see all of these radical stepping stones uh, accumulating. If we didn't do that, we live in a world like this. So I think, you know, there, there are a lot of people who have set out and done something amazing. I mean, Edison's an example, who, who you may think are counterexamples, or, or may, maybe they even some, somewhat, you know, relieve the, the, the anxiety I'm giving you. and say, yeah, this guy's exaggerating how bad the situation is here, because look at all these, all these achievers. Um, but my interpretation of those things is that what's actually happening is that these visionaries are people who realize that the stepping stones have been laid. It's not that they see several stepping stones into the future like some uh, you know, omnipotent visionary and can see the path. It's that they realize that we're just one stepping stone away because of things that were done by their predecessors. So you know, things like um, it, took, it took vacuum tubes to build the first computer. But the people who were designing vacuum tubes were not thinking about computers. If you had told those people that they need to work on making a computer, like go back you know, to the 1800s and say, uh, you're wasting time with vacuum tubes, build a computer. This is a much cooler idea. We would have no vacuum tubes and no computers because they were working on the very stepping stone that we needed. But there was a time where the vacuum tubes were available and, and the, the stepping stones had been created. And so that created that possibility, and someone was standing on that stepping stone at that time and realized, eh, it's just a little bit of a step from there to computation. Um, and so I think, no, the issue is that somebody like Edison is looking at what has been created in the immediate past and seeing that possibility has been created that's just a stepping stone away that we didn't realize before. Uh, yeah, let me say a couple things about that. Um, a stepping stone is something that can lead somewhere interesting. So it's something that creates potential. And I think that um, we have been become afraid to acknowledge that those with expertise have the ability to identify things that are interesting. 
you know, the way we think about it is that we need to subject you to some kind of accountability and assessment to make sure that you're not wrong if we go down this path. So we need some kind of objective metric to say, are you moving in the right direction? But the problem is that the, the stepping stones are the things that we recognize not because they are objectively superior, but because they have some kind of intrinsic potential. And that intrinsic potential is very difficult to formalize, but we see that humans are particularly good at identifying it. So in Pick Breeder, the people who are finding the interesting images are playing exactly that game. You know, they see something that they think is interesting, like the egg with the hat, and they publish that because they think it has potential, it's interesting, it's gonna to lead to other interesting things. We can't exactly say where it's going to lead. Um, and we can see this across, uh, I think, many domains where experts often have these kinds of intuitions. Novelty search, which is this algorithm we created to try to capture this idea, it just says novelty is the proxy. So novelty is like a proxy for interestingness. If you can generate something that's genuinely novel, then that probably will lead to more things that are novel as a stepping stone. But it's not the be all and end all of uh, what, is, what identifies a good stepping stone. What identifies a good stepping stone is ultimately something subjective and that's, the, that's why we have so much discomfort with it, and that's why we tend to align our institutions away from that, because we don't like subjectivity. But we're gonna have to accept subjectivity if we're going to embrace this principle or the objective paradox. Um, we see this kind of phenomenon in several processes. I mean, pick breeder and novelty search are artificial, but they have no final objective. In other words, in aggregate, the people on pick breeder, they're not searching for some ultimate image. That's why it works. Novelty search isn't searching for some ultimate objective, and that's why it works. Natural evolution, there's no uber organism that the whole process was started, set out to finally discover. It's not us. That's why natural evolution is discovering all this stuff. If we were the objective, we wouldn't be here. Human innovation, which was raised earlier, like science, doesn't have some uber invention that all of us are walking lockstep towards as we converge in. Um, this, these are the processes that are most prolifically creative that are known to humankind. And we should be modeling our innovative endeavors more closely with the way that they actually work, which is that they are not objectively driven. These are stepping stone collectors, which means that they're not solutions to particular problems, they're accumulators of potential. The more potential they accumulate, the more potential they can accumulate. And it's that divergence that you see intrinsic in that kind of process that makes it so creative. Let me just say, here's a quote. So from a Chinese philosopher, he said, probably better than I could, a good traveler has no fixed plans and is not intent on arriving. I, and just, just lastly, I just wanna say that, you know, I know this is the end, um, and unfortunately I'm leaving. I, I can stick around until about 5 p.m., so I'll just hang around a little bit. Um, but because of that, I have little opportunity to talk to you guys, and, um, I, but I'd be very more than happy to hear anything, any feedback, positive or negative. So please feel more than free to, to email me at my email address here um, and if you want to talk further. Thank you.